And let's go over the triggers because they're, they're a very big part of how you actually use this API in a friendly way. So events. For every event, you can specify three parameters um, when you bind to it. You can specify the callback, which is your function that will be called with the data. The app name, although you don't need it here, but if we have special identifiers in the future, then you can trigger, you can bind to a specific identifier. And the context, which is the execution context of the function. So for example, is something I can register for. And I'm passing it an anonymous function here, which accepts the data parameter. And for every key in this data, I'm going to alert the key with the actual data. And I can do this at any time. I mean, once the chat has initialized, I can bind at any time. So let's say <coughs> you want to bring something asynchronously to the page, and the, the chat has already started, the API started, and now you want something new to listen to your chat lines, for example. So what you do is you add a listener to the chat line, and we're going we're gonna to go to that in a second. Or let's take this case, the info. You can say chat on info, my new object, dot callback, and register for it. I'm just saying overview. Generally, anything that has an on method on before it, you can register for it in different stages. Some, some things you'll miss. Like onload is triggered almost immediately. So you probably can't start the API and listen to onload. You have to register for onload when you create the instance. So onload. Onload gives you some information. It's very minimized. The only thing that's really important here is the state. It also gives you the version and the API description. And this only happens once for every instance you create. On init. On init it triggers and when it says on in it you know that these methods are now available before the on in it triggers the methods aren't available and you can only register for callbacks but once on in it has triggered then you know first of all it gives you back the account the domain and the init state and you know that you can now call these methods and this is the way the object looks when it returns in the data on available slots we had get available slots get estimated wait time above. So if you registered for those callbacks, not in success and error, but if you go on available slots and you pass in the function, it'll get called back with this information. To, um, to register, you have to create an instance. To register for callbacks, you have to create an instance. It doesn't have to be initialized. To call these methods, to so call methods that actually do something on the chat, meaning you're requesting an action be performed on the server side, the init has to have been fired. Otherwise, you can't perform these actions. Of course, you can create an instance of the chat API, listen to the on init method, and once it is fired, this doesn't you haven't started the chat yet. You've just created an instance of the API, and it has available methods for you. And then you can get get available slots, get estimated wait time, get availability, get pre-chat, and request chat. Does that make sense? Exactly. Slots is, is a count, and um, get availability is true false. And that's for skill? Yeah, or it, it, supports, or it supports whatever you requested. Those are methods that are only triggered if you requested them. So if we'll go back up. So you can request them with specific parameters. And the response is according to the parameters you requested. Okay. So you can also listen to survey events. Like you say, I want to preach at survey, but I don't want to pass in a callback. I want to just get notified when it happens. So you can bind to that and then we'll get back to survey when it triggers. An important event is the on start. This means that the, st the chat state is now chatting. This triggers only when chatting starts. So when you're waiting for an agent, this will not trigger. And this triggers only once. Now you have on state, which tells you it's in a resume state. And when the chat starts, you'll get the chatting state. There's on stop when the chat is ended. Again, this will only trigger once. 
On request chat, as I've shown before, where you can ask synchronously, where you can pass in your callback and be called as a result of your request, you can also bind for on request chat. And it'll pass you on all this data. As I said, it's not very recommended to listen to this event since it has a lot of data and it's not very filtered. It's better to listen to smaller events like on info and online, which give you exact events of what you want to you understand. Here is the on state, on info, and online. Like, it's really better to listen to them because it allows you more granularity on how you handle them. On availability, just like the other ones. On transcript, just like request transcript, it echoes what the where the transcript is going to be sent. Online, okay. This is obviously one of the most important methods that appear in, in the whole API. It's the only way to get chat lines. So it's recommended to register to this when you create the instance. The lines will always come back as an array of objects. And the lines have these different parameters to define them. So what was actually written, at what time, who wrote it, and what type it is. What type it is is very important because if you want to render the chat correctly, you have to notice this. Okay? And when you get a text type that says text, it doesn't matter what your default behavior is. You should always, always, always write it as text. Either create the text note or make sure it's written as text and not HTML. Because for example, if an agent wants to send you an example of a script and you don't want it to run on the page, then you have to write it as text. On state. On state events fire also for on start and on stop. And they signal all the events of the state of the chat. So you can listen to events generically here, but I usually use the on start and the on stop to signify for myself when the chat has ended, when the chat has started. It's just better for clarity since they're major events as opposed to waiting and chatting where you're supposed to handle them more or less the same. On info. So the on info event is something that's aggregated inside the API itself. We actually try to make it as simple as possible, giving you only the information that you want in a way that's very readable. So instead of passing strings that define the typing state and the agent typing state, we pass you booleans. The state of the chat, if it's in progress or currently not in progress. You get here the visitor identification, the agent identification, the chat session key, the last time this was updated, and the chat state itself. These events trigger only when there's been a change in the state, which means that if the previous event and the current event, there's been no change. You're still chatting. Uh, there's no change in typing state. There is no change in actually typing state is handled differently. We'll handle it in a second. But there, there's no major change here that you need to understand, then this event won't trigger. And if you want to make an update or check, I don't know, you want to make sure something hasn't changed, you can always call the synchronous methods. On agent typing triggers separately. And it triggers as a Boolean, true or false. So you can always listen to that and understand the state. So that covers the main methods of the, the API itself. Uh, are there any questions about the methods and the callbacks? Currently, that's not supported. This is my chat sample. It is very, very simple. It's the exact sample that's available in the community. And what I do here is I pass in the site and the app key from the screen is a bit small so you can't see this. So let's just start that over. So my chat API does something very simple. If you saw on the first page, I asked for the site ID, the app key, and the domain. I didn't pass the domain, so it took care of it for me. <coughs> and then I create a new instance of the chat with a number, the app key, and the domain. And I bind to all sorts of events that I want to understand from the get-go. So I bind to the on init event. And if you look what I bound to, as I said, okay, when it initializes, I want to write this log so I understand it initialized. So I get the state initialized, the on init, 
in the on. So that was the on init. In the on state, I did the same thing. I said write for me on the log. It's a very simple method that says write the log and get the data. It writes what method I called and what the data is. Make sense so far? And I do this for all the major methods. So it, it's very important to bind to on init, on info, online, on state, on start, and on stop. I also bond, bind to unagent is typing and on request chat, though I don't do anything except log for the on request chat. As I said, it's, it's not, not a very useful callback since it has too much information to handle. So now we'll start a chat. Um, my button here is bound to start a chat. And when I do that, I bound to the online event. So what happened? Remember I bound to this. And I said, when this happens, add the chat lines. So it gets a list of lines and creates lines and adds them to the DOM. At this point, the API is now polling for you. And it's waiting for an operator to respond. I have an operator logged in here, so I'll just answer. Okay. And now, if you look at the top, you'll see the agent is typing notification. Do you see that at the top right? So I bound to the agent's typing. Once the agent has typed the line and has sent it through, then that'll be canceled. Okay? And if we look down here, you'll see that I got the on info event. And also the triggered events for the on agent is typing, true and false, whenever it changed. So in terms, in terms of how you use the API, it's supposed to be very, very simple. My, my example is very, very simple. It has some helper methods that have to do with binding. And like, for example, adding a chat line, I kept a reference here to my chat instance. And I create it. And then I can send down lines. So I can type here. I just pass the lines in. Now, what I did is I also listened to the callback here. So if the server failed the lines for some reason, now this is creating the lines, sorry. I listened to the error method. So if for some reason, the line did not go through. I actually add a class name to that line in order to make it visible that it's an error. So troubleshooting and best practices. Troubleshooting, there's a couple of things that you can do to troubleshoot the API. One thing is to look at your requests. So one thing is you can do is look at the events itself. Um, the events will happen concurrently every two seconds. These events are polling events. And you'll see that when I perform an action, there'll be specific events for that action suddenly popping out. And when I send a line, you'll see more events for that specific line that pop out. Now, looking at the events themselves, you can understand here <clears throat> what the request what the response is from the server. You have a preview, which you can always debug and look if there is something special here. Since this already deals with the complexity of the rest in the back end, some of the information that you get here is things you'll want to ignore. But you can see that the, the information, like the information that we show in the on info, is something that comes back here with the requests themselves. In terms of best practices, there are no real best practices that are different from good JavaScript coding. So it means if you have objects that are dealing with things, um, it's better to put them together and add the binding methods to the same object. It's always better to have your function encapsulated in a self-executing function so that your members are private and can't be accessed outside unless you explicitly want them to be accessed outside. Uh, in terms of support of this API, this API currently supports it, IE8 and up, because it requires the JSON object from the browser in order to parse JSON strings and to stringify. It might work in IE7, but again, we haven't tested. You can add JS, um, JSON2 or one of the JSON APIs, which add the functionality to IE7 and test. We're not tested for IE7, and we don't officially support it, but technically, there's a good chance this will work for you. No, there's a JSON API um, from 
IE and up, that's a global object called JSON, and it has methods like stringify and parse. Now, since we're using JSONP here and we're sending complicated objects, they have to be stringified in order to send them to the server. Okay? And if, it, if the browser doesn't support that functionality, then you can't send the request. Now, there are, again, Douglas Crockford has JSON2 min, if I'm not um, mistaken, JSON2, which you can use in order to add that functionality to older browsers. But our recommendation is to use i8 and up. It's also what it's been tested on. It depends on the version. Currently, what we have in production supports i7 and up by default. What we support for customers who want to use chat currently is i7 and up. We use our chat. If they want to write an API currently, the chat API version 3 supports i8 and up. Again, this probably works, and I say probably because it hasn't been tested, so I can't verify on i7 as long as you add a JSON um, parser into it. So I think that's pretty much it for what I have, unless you have questions. We have thoroughly tested this, and we actually use this for a couple of things ourselves. So we hope it's completely bug-free, but um, we're all human, so nothing is completely bug-free. Yeah, we've already written a couple of things. The connection panel, I don't know if you've seen the version that was integrated into LE uh, in the beginning, was written over this. They were our first testing platform, and we found all sorts of behaviors and things that they wanted fixed, and we fixed it for them. And I don't know if you've seen the new Live Engage window. Live Engage 2.0 window. So that's written over this as well. And it uses everything from getting the states to getting the surveys to submitting the surveys to changing everything. It relies completely on this. Currently, we are, we are working on it, but currently you can't. There needs to be a back-end implementation to support pipeline chats. And there also needs to be support on the front end in the monitoring passing you the actual visitor so you can pass the visitor on to the chat API. But we are working on it on both ends. That's the only one we know of. That's the only one we know of, yes. Okay. In terms of how, how to get to the API itself, um, the example, let's go to the example first. Hopefully I know my password. So this example uses base, but all you have to do in order to use the API is reference it. It's about 40 some K. And you just reference it on the page and make sure you have it referenced before you actually create an instance. So this is the path. Also in the previous, you can load the API whenever you want. It's up to you. So the API itself checks if the page has loaded or not in a way that if the page has loaded already, then it doesn't bind to the onload event. But if the page hasn't loaded, it binds to the onload event to start working. So there's a code sample, and we all this was not tested for mobile platform. It's not supposed to support mobile platform. Mobile platform does not, does not, mobile platform does not like polling APIs because it drains battery severely. So there is, um, this is actually a discussion we had with our mobile team yesterday. If you have a mobile API to, to support mobile here, we have to have server-side events or long polling. Otherwise, you drain. Thanks, everyone.